where the, you know, the increasing number of guidelines and the increasing pressure for people to use guidelines in, in clinical settings in human health is perhaps leading people to forget about their own clinical autonomy, which would be a worry for all of us. Um, so let's have a quick question. I'm very conscious it's, it's, it's mid-afternoon. Some people's endorphin levels are dipping slightly, so I put a picture up now and again just to keep us all interested. So we all know this guy, right? Mr. Spock, he's the Vulcan, yeah? We're all clear on that. Good. So um, we're not terribly interested in him. We're actually interested in this guy for a moment, Dr. Benjamin <laughs> Spock. Who remembers him? The older members of the audience, <coughs> sorry, the more experienced members of the audience might remember Dr. Benjamin Spock. Dr. Benjamin Spock was, uh, if they'd had breakfast TV in the 1950s, he's the guy that would have been on the couch every time somebody mentioned a baby. Every time somebody mentioned childcare, he's the guy you would have got. Uh, and he's the guy in his book that said there are two disadvantages to a baby sleeping on his back. Basically, if he's, if he's sick, he might drown on the vomitus. You could tell he's very scientific. He didn't say vomit, he said vomitus. Um, and he's the guy that said we should flip them over and lay babies on their tummies in their cots. Yeah? And what was rather odd, he started off in 1948 by saying put a baby on its back. Then he thought hard about this and he said there are you know, disadvantages about this. <coughs> And it was only after a lot of soul-searching, further research, and people saying, hang on a minute, what is going on, that you, uh, you get the Back to Sleep campaign and others that said, you know, this is crazy. Babies are dying because they're going on their tummies because this eminent guy has said so. And Ian Chalmers here, this is the guy who founded the Cochrane Collaboration, uh, and he was a young GP uh, working uh, in the refugee camps of Gaza with Palestinians. And, uh, you know, he looks back on that time. And I've, I've seen him on, on a podium in tears saying, there we were. We, we listened to this eminent gentleman who told us how we should be doing these things. And we did what they said. Tens of thousands of babies died because of that. And that was a seminal moment for, for Ian that led to, you know, one of the things that led to him founding the Cochrane Collaboration. And of course it was, uh, you know, the key word there is, I think. Not, I've done a clinical trial and I've discovered. Not, I've assessed the evidence thoroughly and come to a conclusion. Not, you know, the body of research around the world has told us this. It's, I, I think, because it seemed a natural, sensible thing to do. And I guess, you know, in some logical way, it might seem sensible, what he suggested. But he got it terribly, terribly wrong. So the Cochrane Collaboration, I'm just going to mention a little bit about the Cochrane Collaboration, not just because I used to work there, uh, but because a lot of the things they've been doing since the early 1990s are things that we're now reflecting upon uh, and the work that a lot of great people in the veterinary community in terms of pushing forward for an evidence base for things, a lot of it's founded on this. But uh, Mark this morning mentioned um, Archie Cochrane who, frankly, must have been a dreadful man to know. I mean, he really was, did have some very odd habits and um, some very odd ideas. But like many dreadful people, he was also driven uh, and, and, and drove through a lot of ideas. So there he is um, in, in the army in the 1940s. That's his, uh, his prisoner of war medical card, I think it is, or his ID card. Um, and as Mark mentioned, he was, he was captured in Crete uh, in 1942 uh, and then spent the rest of the war in German prison camps. And... One of his seminal moments was dealing with his patients and the patients who would, who, who were dealing with, let's say, with some sort of, you know, I don't know, an injury or a respiratory problem, whatever it is, people whom in his practice back in the UK, he just said, right, well, take this, you know, take this um, and, you know, go away and it'll do good. And sure enough, three days later, they were either better or they weren't. And these same people, in the prison camps in, in Germany or Greece, uh, he had no medicine. They would present with the same problems and he would say, yeah, I've got nothing for you. And most of them got better or got worse in exactly the same time span uh, as if he'd been back at home giving them medicine. And that was sort of made him think a bit. 
you know, what evidence have I got for any of the things that I'm doing? And he came to the conclusion that almost none. Most of the things he was doing had no evidence what, for whatsoever. And it, it was him who said, you know, the medical community as a whole should gather together, should accumulate the knowledge and produce high quality, relevant, accessible, systematic reviews. This was in the book that Mark was telling about this morning. Um, and it was that call to arms that led to Ian Chalmers, Chris Salagi, Taddy Dixon and others forming the Cochrane Collaboration in 93-94 uh, that is now that global community of 30-odd well, thousand uh, volunteers, mostly you know, clinicians, uh, practice nurses, you know, people like you, doing their work every day but also collaborating and contributing to that work, producing these systematic reviews. So just to, just to I, I met them this morning and I said, you've heard of Cochrane? And they said, no, nope, never heard of it. So let's just buzz through it very quickly. Um, about 30,000 people in 120 countries. They're organised into about 100 different groups. Uh, they're just very organised. You know, they just sort of work themselves out. And the bizarre thing to me is, although none of them have to do it, they all want to know what the rules are and follow the rules. It's great, lovely. Um, and I, I used to have great fun going around to conferences and talking about Cochrane as being the most influential healthcare organisation in the world that nobody's ever heard of. And I think it's fair to say there probably aren't any half-decent clinical guidelines now anywhere that aren't based in some way on the research that, that Cochrane produces. So it's been a quiet revolution. It's been self-sustaining for over 20 years, and I think that's actually quite an important point. You know, most scientific projects you get involved with, or projects at all, they last as long as the money lasts. When the money goes, the project stops. And these guys have been beaving away for this time now. Um, and they've done another load of other stuff as well as producing these systematic reviews. They've attention, focused attention on the quality of clinical trials. Because of course, if you're gonna do a review, it's really helpful if the inputs to that are half decent. Uh, the fight against bias, conflicts of interest, all the rest of it, methodology, amazing methodology they've developed. And they also have great parties. And for statisticians, there are very few places they can go and actually relax. Uh, and this is one of them. And I think that's a huge social benefit for the world. And they should be applauded for that. They produce this thing called the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews. Um, they churn out systematic <coughs> reviews at a huge rate. You know, it's over 400 a year. New ones, a similar number of updated ones. And systematic reviews, they're big pieces of work. Um, and, and do a bunch of other stuff as well. But I think we have a number of challenges that they pose for us. Um, and we need to look at, before we just dive straight in and say, well, let's do what they do. You know, if it's working for them, it should work for us. Let's just, let's just do that. No. It can't work exactly the same for us as it does there, for various reasons. So, um, I often hear that, you know, over in medical land, they've got huge amounts of data, therefore it's easy for them. We in vet land have almost no data at all, um, and therefore it's not easy for us. Can I just mention, I used to work in the prison system, uh, and I started my journey in evidence-based practice by writing the drug and alcohol strategy for Scotland. And I'd had a chat with Ian Chalmers, and he said, you know, you've got to make it evidence-based. Oh, okay. So I wrote the strategy, everything we do will be evidence-based. And it turned out there was no evidence for anything we were doing whatsoever, and, and there was no evidence for any of it. I think we ended up with a 12-step program, because we could find one research paper that was any use at all. But anyway, we have this feeling that they have all this data, therefore they're, they're, they're sort of cushy. So let's have a look at it. Uh, a couple of um, pie charts here. This is the Cochrane Neonatology Group. Uh, I've got a question from a member of the audience now. Rachel, how many systematic reviews have you found so far? 499. 499. 499. So this is one Cochrane group who, this is back in 2013, had produced 262. So they're probably up near the 500 themselves now by now. Um, and they had a look at their reviews and said, well, what are we finding? Well, you know, what, what, what's in there? So um, this is the neonatology group, you know, little tiny babies. So a lot of them are ventilatory stuff, nutritional stuff, pharmaceutical products, etc. cetera. Um, and what do they tell us? Well, 
when they looked at the results of their systematic reviews, 16% of them said, yes, the thing that we're examining, the procedure, the drug, whatever it is, yes, we have good evidence that that is the right thing to do. 16%. So this is of all the procedures and stuff that, were going, that are going on in neonatology at the time these reviews were done. 16% said, yep, do it. 37% said, no, you really shouldn't be doing that either because it's ineffective or it's downright dangerous or, or whatever the reason is. 47%, roughly half, said, you know, after two years' work and all the money and whatever it is it takes to do a systematic review, they get to the end and said, well, I don't know. I have no idea. The data doesn't tell us. You know, because the trials are a bit rubbish or they just can't understand what they're trying to tell us or the numbers don't add up, whatever it is. 47%. And that's in an area of science that we think has got quite a lot of data. So what does that mean for us? Um, we don't think we've got as much data. We're pretty sure we haven't. I, I was sent a paper to peer review last week that, um, I'll just quote a number out of it. He said the average size of an RCT, randomized control trial in medicine is about 456 participants. In veterinary, it's 16, which isn't very many, which means the power of those studies is <coughs> probably quite low. So the conclusion that was came to uh, back in 2012, um, a bunch of people at a meeting in London, uh, in this building in fact, um, is probably not a lot of point in setting off to do large-scale systematic reviews. Yeah, be a lot of effort that frankly will get to the end and say, Ooh, don't know, why bother? So the concept of the uh, critical appraised uh, topic or knowledge summary as we're calling them now because I can't say critically appraised topic um, it comes into play here. So it's like a systematic review, but light. You know, you do, you, you have to, as uh, Kirsten was saying in, in the presentation just earlier, you know, you've still got to uh, work out what your question is and define it properly. You've still got to do a decent search to find the information about that. You've still got to do your critical appraisal and come to some conclusions. But that's sort of where you stop. You, know, you don't go on and try and do a meta-analysis or any of that sort of highfalutin stuff. Um, the information we have seems to suggest it's a much more achievable task. It can be done reasonably quickly by a small number of people rather than having to have a whole team of very highly specialised people um, and, um, you know, and, and presents a reasonable way forward if we're to try and get into our data in the veterinary world in any sensible way. Uh, that, that was just an example of one we um, put together a while ago just I don't know why I put it there, because you can't read it, can you? Um, but the point being, it's reasonably short. It's got the, the data in there that you can go back and look at yourself if you want to uh, examine that and uh, pick over it a bit. Um, so, you know, systematic reviews, they are very complex. Um, and I think one of the problems they've got is that they have a huge number of methodologists involved with Cochrane and, and other systematic review groups. And then part of the snag there is a lot of them are people in research posts and to uh, sorry the research in the room are starting to smile that little crinkly smile you know the one um, and uh, you know part of your function in life is to come up with new ideas and I think one of the problems they've had is they have whole battalions of people coming up with new ideas oh god yeah we've got to get that in we've got to get that one in and and you end up with this monolithic task that's got more and more stuff you've got to do forgetting to say well what are we going to take out you know, if we're adding this stuff in, what are we taking out? Is it still achievable for a registrar in a, in a hospital to actually do one of these things without having large-scale, complex assistance from people who really know what they're doing? Which is why you end up now with a, a team doing a systematic review. You know, you've almost got to have a stato on board with that. You've got to have somebody who understands the complexities of these things. Um, and... Uh, yeah, the, I mean, the whole methodology thing, you know, I made a joke earlier about statos needing somewhere for a party, and, and it, it's great that you've got this methodology, but when that starts getting in the way of actually delivering a useful answer, then we seriously have to question it, and I think it's one of the things we should make sure that we avoid here, and that is overloading the people we would like to join with us and help with this process with tasks that are just unachievable. So, you know, we're all familiar with the acronym KISS, keep it simple, stupid. 
Um, so let's try and achieve something that's accessible, achievable by both the people who we would like to participate undertaking these tasks, but also for the reader. Yeah? Let's hope we can produce documents that people say, oh yeah, I see, works for me. Uh, and then hopefully provide an answer, uh, and, but also something that we can all contribute to. Next uh, challenge. Okay, Cochrane, they've been going for 20 odd years, and their approach is very much, that interests me, therefore I will derive a systematic review about that. You know, here is my clinical problem, or there's the thing I'm researching. And that's great in that it answers real clinical questions from real people. But very often, I think the danger is that you end up answering the questions about the things at the really thin end of the normal curve, instead of saying, well, what are the real problems you should be answering now? Uh, Mark's answer this morning um, to, to, to the question, you know, well, maybe we should be looking at the stuff we do every day. Questioning that, yeah, rather than just assuming that we all know it. Um, so, as I say, Cochrane has been investigator-led, but part of the problem with that is if you're investigator-led, you don't actually map out the territory to say, okay, when we've done this bit, we've got that covered off. When we've got this bit, maybe we've got that covered off. So what we said a while ago is, right, let's go out and actually categorise the veterinary caseload. And then once having categorised it, let's then prioritise within those categories to work out, you know, what do we need to be looking at earlier, middle, later? Uh, there was a, a research uh, grants went out, eight topics, about a million animals involved at, uh, at that time, uh, including emergency care, there we go. And um, so if you looked at equine, you know, and if you look at the top 50% of presentations, these are what you're getting. I'm, I'm not expecting you to read all the letters here. Just, it's just an illustration that it is a process that has been undertaken. Okay. Um, so in the equine, you, you, there it is. And then the similar things for small animal, for livestock, for emergency care, so on and so forth. Uh, there's the small animal ones, again, canine. Um, so, so the next step of that is we will undertake a prioritisation exercise that kicks off quite soon that talks about this and says, right, for this particular presentation, well, what are the questions about it? What don't we know? Um, Ian Chalmers' next project after Cochrane, fun enough, was a thing called Duets, a database of uncertainties about treatment. What don't we know about the treatment that we're offering? Next question, how up to date are we? Um, what have I got? I've got an unhappy horse. I'm, I'm guessing the endorphins have gone down again, so we need to just have a little boost of endorphins. So when it, whenever I've been to a veterinary practice, not very many, but a few, you wander in, and then there's the desk, and then there's a door. And you go through the door, and there's a corridor, right? And just round the corner in the corridor, there's a little place with some things on, on a bench, you know, a couple of computer terminals, a blood machine or something, whatever it is, and there's a shelf above it. Have you seen these? And on the shelf are some manuals, yeah? They all have one. Every practice, it's a known fact. There are the manuals lying in there. Yeah? And these manuals tell you everything to know about veterinary care. So to take an example of one of these, uh, here is an unhappy horse. And if I go to a manual that we happen to have in the RCVS uh, library in our building, it's a great resource, um, it tells you the way to cure, a happy, uh, cure an unhappy horse is to put it in a field next to some ducks that are swimming on a pond. You're smiling like I'm making this up. I'm not making this up. And, and the result is you get a happy horse. It's either a happy horse or a horse with wind. I can't quite work it out. Um, and this manual, it's a real manual, and it's uh, actually uh, published in 1514. And it quotes Cato from the year 70 AD, uh, who, who, who said this. Uh, and just to prove this, uh, there it is. It's in Latin, so it must be serious. And uh, no mention of Harry Potter at all. And um, that is the page, Ventris Quad and Interflorium, I think. I gave up Latin a very long time ago. And there it is. And this is not just a shameless plug for the historical collection of Arceus knowledge. Uh, you know, it, it, my point here, what is my point? My point is, you go to that rack of books, and it might say 2014 edition. Well, that's up to date, isn't it? No? No. Might be. Some of it will be. But if you go to the individual articles, chapters, whatever it is in there, 
you know, how up to date are they? They might have been written in 2012, brilliant. But how up to date was the papers on which that article was then based? You know, and you look back, you might well find the 2014 edition is full of stuff that was, frankly, from the 1950s. You know, you don't know, do you? So we have to look at ourselves and say, how up to date are we? And how do we then manage that process of keeping up to date? And Cochrane, you know, to take their example again, uh, they made a target of making sure everything was updated within two years. It's, it's a struggle. So around about 35, 36% of their stuff is currently marked as up to date. Um, and and yeah, I think we have to think carefully about this. You know, just having a blanket two years is probably a bit blunt. Yeah. So you know, has there been a major new trial or a decent new trial reported recently that might change our uh, results within that? We need to go back and look at um, some things. You know, th there comes the point where, frankly, there is very little point in doing much more research because it's been researched to death and you know, aspirin for one, for various things. Um, another one I like is uh, irrefutable, evidence that it's irrefutable. I love the expression, evidence that it's irrefutable. Who's heard of the mother's kiss? It's not some dodgy net thing, you know, it's, it's, it's a procedure. Okay, so uh, here's the thing, Paul Glasiew, some of you will know, uh, he's a, a GP from Australia, he's back in Australia, he used to run the um, Evidence-Based Medicine Centre in Oxford, and he gave an example of a mum who brought their kid in one day. And those of us with kids know that when they're small, they delight in sticking things up their noses and getting them stuck, right? And this mum brings the kid in. You, you'll learn about this. Don't worry about it. Um, it. Brings the kid in and says, Doc, the little bugger, he's stuck this bit of Lego up his nose again. Da -da. So, oh, God, what does he do? He's a doc, right? He has equipment. So he reaches the drawer brings out the forceps, right, hold the little bugger down, we'll get him, and goes to, oh, hang on a minute, the practice nurse, because nurses are clever people, not just impractical people, uh, says, hang on a minute, have you tried the mother's kiss? And he looks at the mother and says, not yet. <laughs> so uh, he, he, she says, no, what you do is this. You get mummy to take the child, stick finger on other nostril, close mouth over mouth and go, huh! and nine times out of 10, the small object goes ping and drops out of the nose. And that is a procedure known as the mother's kiss, right? I'm no expert, he's the doc, he knows. Um, and think, you know, this is a, Paul then wrote a paper, that's what people do, isn't it? Saying, you know, there are some things, is there any point in doing huge amounts of research about? I don't know, interesting question. Um, question of scale. So, Cochrane has these 30,000 people. <coughs> Sounds quite a lot, but actually if you think of the size of the medical community, I mean, I've no idea how many docs and nurses there are in the UK, just alone. It's far more than that. Yeah. So 30,000 sounds like a lot. It's actually quite a small proportion of the medical community, but it's a, it's a decent number of people. <coughs> Our world is much smaller. Yeah. And, and my contention would be that no one individual university organisation can do this on its own. We have to work together, we have to collaborate and bring in the, the, you know, the talents of all the people we can uh, and, and work together on these things, as Cochrane have done in, in their own way. Um, and by being the sum of the parts, you, know, you also get the Hydra effect. You don't depend on one individual keeping something going because you've got lots of heads of this thing. If you chop a few heads off it, you don't lose the whole thing and you, you maintain the good that you're trying to do. Right, let's move on. Why eBVM? Question number two, the data deluge. So what do we know? We know that, you know, this is in 2012, 300, apparently physicians, GPs in general practice in human medicine, answer around about 330,000 clinical questions each per year. Uh, so I'm told, I didn't count them, but apparently. Um, in the same year, there were 139,056 in fact, many papers published, and there's only 24 hours in the day, right? So, um, what does that mean? Well, you can go to Google and, and look, at, look for answers. There's a hell of a lot of stuff. Yeah, you go to Google Solid and a lot of stuff. Mammary tumours in dogs plus spaying, very simple 
search term. But if you go to Google, you get 395,000 results. If you go to Google Scholar, you get 3270. And if you go to a proper information specialist uh, and do the sorts of things that Kristen and Marnie were talking about earlier, you get a much smaller result. You get 25 results. So straight away, instead of having, in, in, you know, in, in order to get an answer to your question, it's straight away, instead of having to read 300 and something thousand papers, you've only got 25 to read. It becomes an achievable task rather than just a, a mountain that nobody can climb. Um, one thing we didn't, that, that wasn't mentioned in the session earlier, uh, the, there was a lady asking a question about access to resources. Um, one of the things we have, are offering is that if somebody wants to sign up to a knowledge summary, um, A, we will check the search strategy for you, because frankly there's no point in proceeding if your search strategy is a load of rubbish, uh, and B, we will give you a month's free access to the library so you can get access to those papers uh, that you need in order to do the critical appraisal and so on. Right. Um, Moving on, how wrong can we be? Now, the next few slides, um, most of them came from a chap called Martin Whitehead in Chipping Norton. And I'm sure he got them from you, Rachel. I'm, I'm sure he must have done. So you just, <laughs> you, you just give me the thumbs up when we get to them. Okay. <laughs> um, so the question is, how wrong can we be? We're just moving on to another section here. You know, we have this assumption that the thing we do today is probably fine. And over time, there may be issues with that. You know, so we, we, we know that in the past, the things they did were, were complete rubbish. I used to have a horrible histories video here until I discovered that most people over the age of 20 have no idea what horrible histories is. Uh, and they used to have this lovely segment of their show where you'd have this historical doctor offering treatment. You know, and these Vikings would run in and piss all over the patient because urine was good for something. Uh, and I think the best one was the Egyptian with his honey. But anyway, we don't have that anymore. Um, we have a cure for plague, which is useful. Um, and we also have, you know, a number of other things that, um, uh, that, that, that apparently used to work. I'm just hoping the slide's going to do something any second. Don't worry, there's a load of stuff in there that... Um... Here we go. It's coming. It's coming. We're okay. So we have um, you know, snake oil salesmen. We have leeches for just about everything. Uh, we have electricity. And this bloke on the right-hand side here is actually quite famous, apparently. He's, he was called the travelling lobotomist. Who's heard of the travelling lobotomist? So there was an idea back in the 40s, 50s, I think it was, that for patients who were clinically depressed, who you know, wanted to kill themselves in dreadful state, <coughs> one way you could cure that was to perform a prefrontal lobotomy, i.e. remove the front of the brain. And sure enough, most people who have been lobotomized are no longer worried about most of their problems. <laughs> so we have good evidence there. And, and, and this guy is the, uh, it, it's described as the freaking ice pick through the eye socket method of full frontal lobotomy. What I really love about this is um, these are clearly students because they're wearing tweed with ties. This seems to be some sort of truck driver who's wandered in in his, in his vest. <laughs> And the smallest person in the room is the nurse who is holding the patient down who is getting lobotomized. I, I, I'm guessing practice has changed slightly since then. <laughs> What's my point here? My point being that there used to be stuff that people thought was the right thing to do, and nowadays, I'm pretty sure some of them ain't. Now, that's looking back quite a long way, and here are some other ones that, you know, from a little bit more recent. Uh, you know, Marlborough, good for you. <clears throat> Kickstart the lungs in the morning, whatever it is. Um, you know, there's a whole list. I'm not, routine tonsillectomy, tonsillectomy in children. I remember my brother having a tonsillectomy, and I was so jealous. He got to eat ice cream for a whole week. That seemed quite important at the age of four. Um, and, and some more here. Uh, there's, there's a whole load of these. Uh, one I particularly like, and I think has resonance for this audience, is the use of human albumin to treat severe sepsis and burns. Right? So... Uh, it's mostly a, a, a sort of bulk replacement job. Um, Huben albumin solution, you know, it's a blood product. You, what do you do? You, uh, you go to the blood bank, get a little blood, or in the States, you offer 50 quid to a tramp and get a couple of pints. Isn't that how it works? 
Um, and you, you, know, you process that and you extract the albumin and then you use that as a fluid replacement for people with severe sepsis and burns. Great. The only problems being, A, it's a phenomenally expensive way of doing it. It costs around $23,000 per treatment. Um, B, there are, uh, there are severe risks with this. So right now, for instance, the NHS and insurers around the world are paying thousands, millions of dollars to people who have contracted diseases such as HIV and hepatitis through blood, product, blood products. And we know those now don't get passed through. What don't we know? What other things are in the blood that we use for transfusions? It's probably safe, but we don't know. The alternative is saline solution. Okay, so alternatives, human album solution, 23,000 pounds a pop, comes with risk. Saline solution, both are equally efficacious. Right? No difference in outcome between the two. What is really interesting, the NHS said, Bloody hell, we're not spending 750 million pounds a year doing this anymore. Right, so they don't do it anymore. The United States insurance-based system, right? So when evidence-based medicine kicked off back in the early 90s, there was a real big kickback in North America, particularly in the US, from doctors who say, how dare you tell me how to use my clinical judgment? You will not tell me how to do stuff. And they kicked back, so they still use this. They're still using human album solution rather than saline. Not everybody, but it's still in widespread use. And that's a very curious reason why. And one of the reasons being that uh, the margin on a £23,000 or dollar product is quite good. The margin on a threepence bag of saline solution is rubbish. Let's leave that one hanging. OK, so there's a, there's a few more things on this list that I'm sure is Rachel's list. Um, we'll, we'll, we're not looking at them in detail. Is it not you? Okay, I'll, I'll leave it to Martin then. <laughs> I'll leave it all to Martin. Yeah. Maybe the next list is yours. Yeah, I don't know that much stuff. Um, <laughs> but why? You know, why do people do these things that, when we look back, seemed a bit rubbish? Well, they do it because they were taught it in the schools. They were taught it because the textbooks, the journals tell them it's the right thing to do. They, sorry, they do, it, uh, they, they, they do it because the eminent people around them in their peer group, in their practice, whatever it is, you know, if, if, if you say, oh, we're not doing that, there's no, what do you mean there's no evidence? We always do it that way. I've always cut people's legs off at the knee because it stops their feet itching, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, the, the, these doctors, they're, they're not bad people. They're not stupid. They're not deliberately negligent. They're good people trying to do their best for their patients, but it turns out they were wrong. And we now know they were wrong. So, why are there all these human medicine examples? Because they've looked, because they've done the work, they've gone and done the systematic reviews, they've done the comparisons, the trials, and all the other things. Why are there so few examples for us? Because we haven't done it yet. We've hardly started, you know, at the beginning of that journey. And, and right now, our friends from the pet insurers, you know, they're paying out for stuff that doesn't work. They're paying out for stuff that, frankly, does damage. But we don't know which ones those are yet. Just as a slight aside, I used to work in the prison system, and you could speak to any prison governor, and they would tell you they could let 50% of the prisoners out today, and there'd be no problem whatsoever. Snag was, we didn't know which were the 50%. It's a bit similar in some ways. OK, so here's a few uh, veterinary examples that, uh, that Martin very kindly provided. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of them, because obviously I'm not a vet, and you guys are, and you know what they're all about. So we'll just pop them up there, and we'll go through them, and then please don't ask me about them, because I wouldn't know. So there's a few. Um, there's a few that might need a bit looking at. Animal vaccination of cats. Ooh, what do you think? Um, so a few more. Yeah, yeah. OK. So. What are we going to do about it? Do we just say, no, it's too hard. Can't do that. It's not going to work. No, we don't. Um, we build on the work that many people have started already, and we say, come on then, together, we can actually do something about this. We don't have to just let it go on as it is. And uh, my view is that we don't just do it for vets here in the UK. 
because this is the internet these days. You know, everything we do goes on the internet and everybody reads it. And whether you've got a solar-powered donkey or a donkey that is clearly suffering under rather too great a load, you know, we, we, we have to think everything we do now is being accessed by people globally. And with that mindset, you know, it, it does make a difference. So we, in RCVS Knowledge, we have a, we have a cunning plan. Uh, it is a quiet revolution. Um, and it has phases. I, I was in the army for a bit, so we have to have phases. Okay? And th those are the phases. We'll, we'll run through them very quickly. So the first thing is about creating this network. So we, 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 we copy and Cochrane a bit here. But what we're saying is, you know, we can't do it in our office. Rachel can't do it alone in her team. The guys at RVC, Bristol, Edinburgh, wherever, they can't do it alone. But together, you know, we've got more of a chance. <laughs> One of the things I love about the training resource we looked at earlier is going around to people saying, yeah, there are 13 vet schools involved with that. And 50% of the reaction I get is, there are only seven vet schools. Yeah, there might be seven in the UK. And there's a few others, you know. They're well spread about. But together, we can, we can actually do something. We can start to grip this. So we've got you know, a little over 900 people so far in 34 countries. There's nobody in Fiji yet, which, which worries me, because my ambition is to go to Fiji for a conference one day, but we'll, we'll manage it. Um, and, and we see our role at, at RSVS Knowledge as sort of like the facilitator at the centre of this, trying to sort of pull things together, work it out, and, and so on and so forth. So by creating the network, we think we will build this body of people who can take this task on and, and contribute to it over time. Uh, building the, the foundations, I was dissing methodologies earlier, but we need to work out how we're doing this stuff. Yeah, so the, the learning resource you've just seen is a, is a great way of making sure we all start to have a common understanding of how we're going about this, how we, how we disseminate things, the tools we need. Uh, I mentioned earlier research in the veterinary caseload, you know, so that we have a good common understanding of the scale uh, and scope uh, of, of the task we're looking at. Um, so we've launched the online learning zone today. It's fabulous. I mean, I've, I've had a chance to look through it properly. It really is great. Go and have a look at it. Uh, we're also um, launching the Knowledge Summary Handbook today, you know, how to actually do this job of producing a knowledge summary. And um, the topics prioritisation exercise should be kicking off in the next month or two, which is where we look at that caseload and say, right, OK, you know, for instance, what are the things that people do every day? What are the things you do once a month? What are the things you do once a year? And can we please not worry too much about the stuff you do once a lifetime? We'll come back to that one later when we've, when we've done the rest. Reflecting on Mark Baker's point earlier about, you know, where do we start with this? Ooh, twice. Excellent. Uh, training and upskilling. So we've got the learning resource, um, providing CPD opportunities, so on and so forth. I'm, I'm just going to crack through these. I'm sure it's endorphin downtime, so we'll just keep going. Um, and then in terms of outputs, you know, what, what, what do we need to get out for people? We need... Um, Practice pieces about you know, how do we do this stuff? How do we implement evidence-based practice in, in our own areas? How do we do these knowledge summaries? How do we do these other things? Um, how do we conduct clinical audits and clinical governance uh, systems? You know, systematic reviews. You know, there are times when it will be appropriate to do those larger-scale systematic reviews. Okay, uh, in the next session, uh, Rich Evans is going to be talking about veterinary evidence, which we formally launched today. Uh, it's the submissions site we launched today. I'm afraid we can't give you any content yet, but you know, you, you've got to launch your submissions before you can actually get any outputs. If you work it out, you know, you've got to get content. Yeah. Um, and conferences and seminars is another great dissemination strategy. So we've got Skills Day today, and we've got our uh, main conference in Edinburgh next year, 1st to 3rd of uh, November. I do hope we'll see some of you there. The call for abstracts that is open now. So if anyone's interested in putting an abstract in, please do. Put in several. Put as many as you want. Very pleased to see them. Uh, and of course, uh, as was alluded to in an earlier session, the, the new RCVS practice standards scheme does um, you know, mention evidence-based quite a lot these days. So uh, the, the new one that's coming out, I think it's coming out, November, if I remember. Anyway, there we go. Um, quick slide about the conference next year, just to remind ourselves. 
Uh, if it's anything like the one we had last October, it should be good fun. It was a bit of a blast, uh, and we're really looking forward to it. I'm going to stop there, honest, really, uh, leaving a few minutes for questions before we have to be anywhere else. Now, if anyone wants to ask a question, where did I put that? You got it. There is a microphone, so please put your hand up. Yes, wait, or as we say in the army, wait for it. Uh, and then ask your question. Who wants to be first? Somebody. Yes, Rachel. Is it, hello. Hello. Oh. Okay. Um, I've got sort of a question and a comment. The first question is, where is the knowledge summary handbook on the website? Because I've just Googled it. I can't find it. You'll learn about that at uh, approximately whatever okay. time this afternoon. So it's not there yet. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Well, that's it, it is, but it's being launched yeah, later. Cool. So I don't um, want to take Richie's thunder away. <laughs> Sorry, don't want to. Um, my other was a comment, really. So we've um, best bets for vets that um, knowledge summaries will be similar and complementary to has been we've been publishing them live for about two years, so we're starting mm. to update them now. It's just a comment around the Cochrane thing, and it's interesting mm. that thirty six point eight percent are up to date. Mm. So we've started looking at them. So these are really simple um, clinical questions. And the majority of them, after two years, don't have something new that's specific to that question. We obviously yeah. often find something interesting that's kind of relevant, but doesn't actually answer the question. So at the moment, we're in the process of updating about 20 of them, because that's how we launched the site. And it's probably about a one in five hit rate where we go, oh, there's yeah. something. So mm -hmm. it might not be too bleak, but I think that idea of how often should we do them is something that we need to address differently and separately from the medics. So uh, I don't I have so. the answers yet, but kind of that's yeah. where we are. Interestingly, the Cochrane have been doing quite a lot of methodological work on this, <laughs> as you'd expect. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think it's Julie Glanville um, yes. has published a couple of papers on it, and I know they've been thinking of changing their approach. Yeah. I think one of their concerns is if they look as if they're stepping back from their commitment to update every two years, people will say, ooh, ah, oh, you know, ooh, they're, they're dropping the ball on this one. That's what they're worried about, I think. Yeah. I don't think they should be. Because uh, as you rightly say, you know, some things... It only takes a very very quick look to understand there's no particular need. But of course, the other thing that they have to update for is improved methodology. You know, so you ask, you add in a new risk of bias tool, and then people say, "Oh, you need to go back and change them all." You yeah, know, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's it's, it's a big, I think it's a bigger problem for them than it is for us. But yeah. but you're absolutely right. You know, you have to enter a process and make sure it's done properly. So can I just comment on that, which is maybe no help whatsoever, but from what I've seen that things move quite slowly in the veterinary world, and I'm only doing that in terms of citations on veterinary record, where within two years we don't get that many citations, uh, which obviously affects our impact factor. Five years down the line, we actually perform very well compared with quite a lot of other titles. So things just take a line to filter through, and that might yeah. influence the, 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 the period that you look for. Interesting. Mm. I think you're probably right, and um, you know it, 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 it's not just that things are a bit slower. Maybe it's the lower volume as well, in, in that speed. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Ava Firth. Ava Firth. Ava Firth from, Firth from Vets Now. Um, I'm curious about the knowledge summary register. Now, is that going to be revealed later? But you had that on your slide. Ah, yes. Uh, that was actually a trials register, a uh, clinical trials register, I think, wasn't it? Mm. So um, my question is, who's keeping tabs, and how can we keep tabs on who's writing which knowledge summaries? Uh, yes, um, yes. There is, sorry, you're quite right. There is an intention to do something about that. Uh, it's on the to-do list. Uh, it's not there yet. Um, one of the things we want to do is to... Yeah, sorry, it was the title register, wasn't it? And I forgot to talk about it. So one of the things we want to do, as we do the prioritisation exercise, that then gives us an indication of what titles should be prioritised in terms of the knowledge summaries. So what we'll do, we'll have an online database of those you know, indicative titles and then an indication. I don't, I don't know that we put people's names up against them. I think we'd sort of probably put a thing in saying, you know, this one's occupied for now. Uh, and the, the sort of the initial thinking is we'd give people a period of time. You know, let's say you step forward and say, oh, I'd like to do the knowledge summary on da 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 you know, we block it out for you for a period of time, uh, give you an opportunity to get that done, 
And then if it hadn't been done by a certain time, we'd be coming back and saying, is it going to get done? Can we free it up for someone else to have a go? Something like that. That's what that was about. Can you yeah. speak more about the prioritization exercise? Um, I can. Um, so we, 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 we did the, well, we, you, did the caseload exercise. Uh, you did the emergency care one, thank you very much, and, and did those wonderful presentational graphs of the data. Um, so what the prioritization exercise will do, um, are we all familiar with the Delphi process? Um, basically, you know, you, 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 you ask the big question, then you sort of narrow it down a bit and do various phases. I'm talking rubbish, yeah, aren't I? Look, so uh, a lady called Sally Crow, I think has worked with you as well, um, uh, who's worked with uh, Ian and the Duets program, um, they uh, will be working with us and looking at those titles and then what we'll do, we'll sit down with focus groups, surveys and stuff, you know, yourselves, practicing vets, uh, the industry and, and so on and so forth and say, okay, you know, in this particular area of caseload, what are the unanswered questions? Uh, and then get a, a, get a consensus on where we think those gaps are so that we can then put those forward as the priority um, knowledge summaries. Did that help at all? Kind of. Oh, God. Um, mm, it's sort of pencilled in to start after this meeting. Sorry, hello. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I Rachel, still go ahead. Um, I adapted the JLA method that um, Nick's yeah. talking about for my master's that I did with Oxford in evidence-based healthcare, which um, often starts with a very high-level survey where you ask people what questions they have on a certain subject. You then find the ones that do have an evidence base to them and collate the evidence base, and you separate the one out the ones that don't. You then often have to do another survey that shortlists them, but if you've only got a few questions, you go straight to focus group technique that Nick was talking about. So the, at a very high level, all the questions come from the profession, and you can combine that with a clinical caseload to see what the relative frequencies are within real life and what people actually think. Um, so you get an idea from the whole profession of what's important and a degree of prioritization, but then you do the nitty-gritty with individual groups. It's a very clever technique. They've got lots of lovely stuff on their website. So it's the James Lind Alliance, the man that discovered we could... Um, cure scurvy with citrus fruits if you can't remember his name just put limeys in there and you'll get to James Lind and they because they work with patients and humans so much their website's really easy to understand and in terms of your own healthcare it's a really interesting place to go but it starts very high level across the whole profession and then narrows itself down so we actually make a decision I can send you my thesis if it's that if you like I'm sure we can find it through Google <laughs> what, what would we look for <laughs> Anyone, uh, just, um, Nick, just a comment, if you would, on you might call the downstream impact of eBBM. Mark this morning made reference to evidence-based medicine in the human side being, uh, if nothing else, helpful in legal defence. Yeah. Um, where do you see the whole eBBM story going, uh, both in terms of um, professional? Uh, defence, shall we say, mm. and indeed in terms of uh, what's on the screen behind you, in, in terms of mm. professional insurance or indeed um, uh, health insurance for animals, okay. and what's I mean, the impact of EBVM yeah. going to be on that? I mean, talking from my own experience, uh, when I was at Cochrane, um, what, what we found was that um, a, a lot of clinicians who were being hauled up in front of GMC or whatever the equivalent is in Australia or Germany or whatever, um, the, the, assuming that they you know, we're doing the right thing, probably. The first thing they do, they would get in, tend to get in touch with us and say, look, have you got a Cochrane person who can appear as a witness for us to say that, yes, there is a systematic review or, or whatever it is that confirms the thing I was doing was an appropriate act uh, in, in that circumstance? And we'd say, yeah, sure, get in touch with this group, one of their... And you know, 99 out of 100 of them would never get to court. As soon as that person was listed as a witness... And, and very clearly they were about to say, yes, what they were doing was based on good sound evidence. It, it, it would just disappear on 99 out of 100 occasions. Does that help at all? Well, at least the inevitable question is, what extent are you linking with BBS? Um, not very much at the moment. I, I did have a chat with your boss a while ago. Well, the VDS boss. Oh, you're VBF. Oh, no, sorry, no, you're the other, you're the other one. Sorry. I did, I did have a chat with a fella a, a while ago, and we haven't, seen, we haven't speak, spoken since. Um, yeah. yeah. 
we've, we've encouraged them to uh, embrace the concept. Who else have we got? Anybody? Got Hello. Quick question. Um, stumbling block I have in practice uh, introducing... Sorry. Uh, stumbling block I have in practice introducing EPBM to my younger associates <coughs> is that... Um, you know, the increasing number of referral centres in this country with specialists, so they are the people who do CPD these days. Mm. My associates go to their CPD, and they come back right. with this knowledge, and they say, well, that's it. That's the truth, um, you know, irrespective of what's been written. Yeah. We've been told today that X, Y, and Z is the correct treatment for this disease. Why mm. do we bother with, you know, this malarkey which we're all talking about today? Yeah. And I... <coughs> You know, I'm, I'm it's difficult, left, isn't it? I'm not so worried. Yeah. Um, it's difficult. and Because, um, you know, they, they are eminence, but are they yeah. using their own personal well, stuff? I mean, maybe that's the point where you kick in with your own journal club or whatever, or, or some of the other tools that were being, you know, um, tra trailed is the right word, isn't it, on the, um, on the EBVM learning site, where people can come back and discuss those things and say, well, this is what we've heard. What do we think? Yeah. Um, it, it, it is difficult. And... Joe's about to say something, but I just want to say something very quickly first. I mean, as I've been going around the schools, actually one of the biggest questions I get is, and I think we got the same one at your school when I went, was from students saying, look, you know, I absolutely get this, but when I get to practice, how is that going to work? When I, the new boy, the new girl, are saying to, you know, old bloke, what do we think about this? And, and that worries people. I, I was going to respond to this question, if that's right, interrupting you. Please, I, yeah. I think it will get better as mm. undergraduates get more involved in evidence-based family medicine. Because I think once we explain to them that the eminence issue, you know, what that means, and that learning isn't just about knowledge, do you know what I mean, and about asking questions, and that they get involved in doing these things, they may it may change. But we do live in a culture now where... You're, if you're a specialist, you know better. And there's been some quite art, nice articles, Stephen May's written one about that, which is, you know, we've got to try and change that culture a little bit. I'm not saying the specialists don't know what they're doing, it's just then also it's getting the, the, this to make, you know, that primary care is so critical and that people at that in primary care can contribute to this yes. themselves, I think, Absolutely. isn't it? So yeah. I think, you know, let's hope that that's what the vision yeah. of the future can look like. We've just yeah. gone through this phase, I think, haven't we, of, of that culture which we in the vet schools encourage because we have all these hospitals full of specialists. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. I've just got a quick thing. I'm a veterinary nurse. Okay. Um, obviously, the, the whole knowledge thing has got a lot of very experienced vets behind it. Is there any way of bringing any nurses on board? And Are you here on a bursary? No. No, oh, God. Yeah, you must be the only one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I... I I'm really keen that the whole veterinary profession is involved here, whether it be the industry, the suppliers, the practitioners, the veterinary nurses, the veterinary surgeons, the teeth manglers, the hoof wanglers, whatever it is, you know, they all need to be in this room. And to, to excuse myself for using a cracked record again, I keep looking at the Cochrane example. And I look, for instance, at the Cochrane Wounds Group that was that is led by somebody who was a nurse you know and and moved into the academic side <coughs> of nursing um and it's a great shame to me that i've completely forgotten her name today uh, and and um i was talking about her to someone else earlier you know she's now dame whatever the hell her name is <laughs> i'm so sorry i'm gonna have to find out um on account of the work she's been doing with cochrane and other work as well over the years but specifically her involvement with this um, and I look at uh, Sally Green, uh, Professor Sally Green, who is head of the uh, Australasian Cochrane Centre. You know, she's a physiotherapist. She's not a cancer specialist. I mean, she's a physiotherapist. And, and there's a similar pattern. So, um, you know, another, another lady, God, I'm rubbish at names today, uh, who, who was chair of the Co Cochrane Collaboration at, at one time. You know, she, she's a nurse who'd moved into academic nursing. So, yeah. You know, there's a big open door and a bloody great tent full of people, as far as I'm concerned. Just, just turn up. That's all you have to do. All right? Hi. It's, uh, my name's Mary Fraser from Edinburgh Napier Hello, Mary. University. Just on that point, we do have a vet nursing knowledge oh. group, yes. which we're looking for people to help us with. And, and the chair so, is sitting right behind so you. We should exchange emails <laughs> later on. But I was going to ask <coughs> the prioritisation exercise. Yeah. That all seemed to me to be veterinary 
surgeon based. Have you done any vet nursing prioritisation? Uh, I, I very much hope that they will be in, as part of the process, part right. of the because yeah. that, I mean, that is one of the questions is that yeah. there are areas of overlap like sure. wounds and analgesia but there's yeah. also specifically nursing areas sure. as well and it's how how we well let's to make sure that. you know let's make sure though you know when we put the call out for people to participate in the focus groups things let's make sure your group's in there yeah yeah i mean it's easy as that anybody else um it's 3 30. it's 3 30. well done everybody thank you very much for being patient thank you <laughs>